Hey there, welcome. It is good to have you with me today. Today we are going to be talking about the iridology, the history of iridology, and look at the fact that it is an evolving science. Just want you to take just a minute and find that chat box. I really like to do things interactively. And so I'm going to be asking you to be involved and to answer questions and to give feedback as we go through. It's a nice way to make sure that you haven't fallen asleep on me, right? Okay, so we need to understand um, the history of iridology because iridology is evolving. And that means that some of what we thought 40 or 50 years ago has been disproved. The sad thing is that there are a lot of people who are still teaching that outdated information. So we are going to look at the history and the evolution of iridology. We're going to do it really quick. It's not going to be a painful history lesson, I promise. And then we're going to look at some of the things that we used to think were true, and we're going to look at how they're not true and move things forward. Does that sound like a good plan for tonight? If it does, let me just get down here and make sure I've enabled comments. If that sounds like a good plan for tonight, then let me know in the chat box. It's just going to be a good plan, and we'll move forward with that. Fantastic. Hi, Tessa. Good to see you here. Good to see you here. All right. So quick introduction to me. My name is Judith Cobb. I am a master herbalist, natural nutrition, clinical practitioner, and a level three IPA certified iridology instructor. Uh, IPA makes us update our credentials every two years, and they've been giving out badges for four years. I've been a member of IPA for decades, and I've been a certified instructor for with them for, over, for close to a decade now. And I've been teaching iridology for about 35 years. So lots of experience under my belt, professional member of the Canadian Association of Holistic Nutrition Professionals and the Canadian Association of Natural Nutritional Practitioners and the Alberta Herbalist Association. So um, as we work through things, um, I'll throw in little bits and pieces probably of herbs and protocols as well when we get to where we're actually looking at eyes. History. All right. So iridology has been around for way longer than you or I have been around, right? It's got its roots back in Egypt, India, China, and Greece. What we need to remember is that iridology has evolved. You know, we used to think the world was flat. Well, we didn't, but somebody did before my time that the world was flat. And that, um, you know, if you sailed far enough, you'd fall off the edge of it, right? We now know that's not true. There are still some people who choose to believe that it's flat in spite of all of the evidence to the contrary. What we need to remember here is that good scientists ask questions. Good scientists ask questions and then they ask more questions and then they ask more questions, right? And so that's what's been happening with iridology. People have been asking questions and doing research and evolving the whole science, which is exactly what we want to have happen. We don't want to be stuck in the past. Now, how many of you have heard the owl story? If you've heard the owl story, raise your hand or put owl in the chat box. Have you heard the owl story? We're going to share it very briefly, and then we are going to kick it to the curb. Okay, so we've got kind of, thanks, Tessa, appreciate that. The story goes that in the early 1800s, a little 11-year-old boy named Ignaz van Petschley, he was not an MD yet at the time, he was an 11-year-old boy, caught or trapped or somehow got a hold of an owl, we think it was an owl, um, that had a broken wing or broken leg or something. And so this little boy took this owl home and nursed it back to health. And in the process, what he, what he says he saw was a black line in the owl's eye. And as the owl healed, the black line disappeared. Let's look at this critically. Uh, first off, there are so many wild bird sanctuaries where you can take a bird that has been injured, give it to the techs and the vets there, and they will nurse this animal back to health, and then they will rehabilitate it and release it back into the wild. Don't you think that somebody in one of those facilities would have noticed something similar? if they had seen this happen in an eye, don't you think that would have been a real curiosity for them? Some other things we need to remember are that 
a bird's eye, most animal eye structure, their iris structure is different from that of a human. So we can't necessarily extrapolate from one animal, especially one species to another. Okay, so those are a couple of really important things that make us debunk this, this story about the owl. Now, what I want to say here is whatever Ignatz saw, whatever he thought he saw was it was enough to intrigue him so that when he was all grown up, he did become a medical doctor. And he started drawing out his patient's eyes with colored charcoals and things like that and writing out their story. He didn't have a computer to do a word search in a database kind of thing. He was doing this all by hand. And um, he started to figure out that, well, when people say they have this symptom, many of them have a mark in this part of their eye. He gradually started to sketch out one of our first modern iridology maps. So regardless about the owl story, we're just going to throw it away, but we are going to be ever grateful to him for persisting and developing, helping to develop the first iridology map. His uncle um, said this of him, this was August von Petschley, recognized years later that Ignatz was looking at an owl's eye eyes and not that of a human, and that he did not have the proper equipment to prove what had been recorded in the stories. It's time for iridology to move forward based on sound research rather than hearsay. Totally agree. Then we have Pastor Nil Lilliquist. And this is where we're going to start seeing some of what I call the modern myths, okay? So Pastor Neil Lilliquist, again, uh, was an iridology, uh, an iridologist, and he correctly correlated that fiber density or threads per square inch correlate to the ability to resist disease and to not have the body break down as easily. So when we, he would see an eye like this, he would know that this person was more resilient. They could ward off illness. If they had an injury, they could heal more quickly. Someone with an eye like this would be more prone to becoming ill would have a harder time regaining their health. And if they were injured, it would take a longer time for them to heal. Totally correct on that, 100% correct. He also said that he felt that spots like this and pigment like this in the eye were due to toxic exposures. So this person might've been, in his opinion, exposed to a medication or you know, various medications were or big pharma was just sort of in its infancy. Um, and so he felt that this was a result of that. We now know that is not correct. We now know that these pigments that we see in an eye are actually the result of genetics. They are, they're epigenetic indicators. They teach us which organ wants to be out of balance and where it wants to throw its influence around to affect another organ. Pigments arise in the eye because of epigenetic cueing, not because of toxic exposure. Pigments will not dissolve in the eye because the body has no way to remove them once they are there. So have some of you, had some of you heard that you could cleanse pigments out of the eye? If you do this cleanse, if you buy these supplements, if you do this all fruit diet, we're going to get rid of pigments. You're going to turn those eyes pure blue. Have you heard that? I want to know in the chat box. And, you know, if you've heard it, there's, there's no shame in that. You've heard it, right? That's information that's out there. Yeah. And Erica is saying, yes, she's heard it. And I got to tell you, it's not right. Jennifer's heard it too. Yeah. Thank you. And Tessa said, just had a friend send me something saying that the other day I had to correct her. Tessa, I am proud of you. I am so proud of you for having correct information and for spreading correct information. That is so, so important, so important. So we now again know that and understand that it's melanin is the actual pigment that shows up in the eyes and it is not the result of toxic exposure. And we're not going to erase it. It's going to be there forever and ever and ever, right? Then we have Pastor Emmanuel Falca. He started laying the foundation for others to build by defining the constitutions. If you've been with me for some of these in the past, we've talked about the three foundational constitutions. He also taught iridology. There's an institute in Germany that is named after him now. It's called the Falca Institute. 
Germany is an interesting place. In Germany and Russia both, you have to be either a medical doctor or what they call a hail proctor, which is like a naturopath in order to practice iridology. I would not be able to practice in Germany. Does that give you a, a little bit of an insight that there might be some validity to iridology? Tessa says, yes, thank you, Tessa. Okay, Rudolf Schnabel. All these men are, are, these researchers are coming from that Germany area, Germany, Hungary, uh, places like that, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, he researched more on the pigment. So he was able to help us sort out some of the pigment information. And he did research about pupil size and shape. He was one of the first to use microscope to examine the iris. We know that pupils are not usually round. And when we see a flattened side or many flattened sides, it suggests to us where the spine has been subluxed for a length of time and what organs will be influenced because of that. Very cool stuff, right? We actually teach that in dynamic iridology. We do a module on that one. Schnabel said, oh, and I so agree with him, oh, I so agree with him. I want to just reach out and give him a hug for this. It was no easy task that those who believe or would like to believe that handling iridoscopy or iridology can be learned within a few days or even a few weeks or even a few days are mistaken and do a disservice to a good cause. I see so many people teaching 12 hour workshops or six hour workshops or three day workshops and at the end they give a certificate and you're now a certified iridologist. I was like, no, you've learned how to identify markings, but you haven't learned how to connect them. You haven't learned how to correlate them to your client's symptoms to give you the understanding of why your client has the problems they've got. You've only learned to identify markings, right? You can read the map, but you don't understand the map. And so I agree with Rudolph, it takes way more than a few weeks or a few days to, to get this under your belt. Joseph Unger was one of Schnabel's students. So now we're getting into second generation iridologists. He became a naturopath. He was very concerned because all of these different iridologists were creating their own verbiage to go with what they were seeing and what they were describing and what they were understanding. So we had all these different people all looking at the same markings, but using their own words for them. And Joseph, wanted to unify that he realized that was creating confusion which even now it does when we look at jensenian language versus rayed language versus constitutional language uh, there's so many sets of words that go around with these and that's what joseph was wanting to to work with was to try to simplify it, to try to unify it he knew that students were reading books and accepting the printed word about iridology before adequate research was completed. So many of these early researchers were publishing books, but they were publishing them really based on theory rather than on proof. You know that saying, you can't believe everything you read? It's absolutely true about iridology. You can't believe everything you read. Joseph was a little bit different. He did not publish his work would not publish his work until he had given it to basically a jury of his peers for them to read it and test it and make sure that it was good information. I really love that level of integrity. That is so important. Joseph Deck was another iridology researcher and he pioneered iridology photography. He was also an iridology instructor. So he was one of the first people to begin photographing the eye up close. Very interesting because the science of photography back in, in those days was not well developed, right? I mean, he died in the 1950s. Theodore Krieger studied with Anger, Deck, and Schnabel. So he studied with three of the original pioneers again. He felt that iridology was a number one assessment tool and that it was best used with other assessment tools like urine analysis, hand analysis, fingernail, tongue, feces. And he, he loved that you could take iridology and you could use it as a proving point to prove what you'd found elsewhere, to corroborate information. 
He said, I hope that a later generation will succeed in establishing a single uniform system. In spite of zealous efforts, these have so far not succeeded. Yep, we are still there, still not succeeded. Then we're up to modern day, right? We have Bernard Jensen. Who's heard of Bernard Jensen? If you've heard of Bernard Jensen, give me Bernard in the chat box. Well, Bernard was teaching the eyes will change when we do things, right? When we do the right diet. So Tess has heard of Bernard. Um, you change your diet, you take these supplements, you're going to change the eyes, you're going to change the color, you're going to move fiber around, you're going to do all these things. Now, I got to tell you, Bernard was working against the odds here because look at the years he was alive. All of this research was happening in Germany and Russia. It was happening on the other side of the world. Information wasn't coming over quickly or easily. We didn't have the internet yet. And a lot of it was being done behind the Iron Curtain. So he wasn't getting it. He worked with what he had. He kept iridology alive in North America pretty much on his own for all those years. And he did a lot of good for a lot of people. I'm not going to diss Bernard for that. I wish I'd met him. I was, I started studying iridology in 1980, but um, you know, we had a young family and there was no way I could take off for a week or 10 days. Didn't have the funds. It was all going into kids and, and, you know, a week or 10 days leaving my husband with all those kids. I think he would have been certifiable by the time I got home. So couldn't do that, unfortunately. Then about 1980, Harry Wolf, who was an American born German, he could read and speak German fluently as well as English, uh, got a hold of a Joseph Deck book. And he started studying it. And he was in holistic stuff and massage and herbs and all that kind of good stuff. And he was getting excited about this. And he was going around and teaching what he learned in little fairs and things like that. He connected with Bill Cardona, who at the time was a registered pharmacist. And Bill, loved this stuff he as a pharmacist he recognized that what he saw a lot in the pharmacy was the same people coming back for either the same prescription or a stronger version of that drug or a different drug that was stronger people were not getting well on drugs they were in in that medical treadmill right in that big pharma treadmill so he started studying iridology with harry they started teaching workshops and taking it around and Bill started teaching iridology at Bastyr Naturopathic School. I don't think they offer the course there in Seattle anymore, but he taught there for many years. And then he eventually became an ND as well. Bill was my constitutional instructor. Very grateful to him for that. Um, Jensenian, Rayid, and constitutional, those are the three primary styles of iridology that are taught in North America right now. Have you heard, I know you've heard of Jensenian because you've heard of Bernard Jensen. Have you heard of Rayid? And have you heard of Constitutional? Let me know in the chat box. If you've heard of Rayid, just give me an R. If you've heard of Constitutional, just give me a C so that I know what we're going. So Tess has heard of Constitutional. Yes. Okay, so is Tessa the only one who's heard of any of these styles? Some of you might be pretty new to this. Some of you, uh, I know I've seen some of your names in my mini classes before, but some of you are, I think are pretty new. Jensenian, let's talk about this really quick. Jensenian was originally taught by Bernard Jensen. That makes good sense. He taught that the iris changes when the body changes. So we would move fibers around in the eye. We would change pigment. We could change color based on diet and lifestyle. Traditional Jensenian iridologists have do often done iris readings cold with no background information from clients. Now, I don't like the word readings because it's not a reading, it's an assessment. And here's the difference. A reading is, I'm telling you things. You know, I, it's I'm telling you things you don't know about yourself. An assessment is, I'm gathering information from you. We're having a conversation and I'm putting this together in the context of you, all right? And so I know there's, uh, was a Jensenian iridologist here in Calgary, a very well-known herbalist, and I'm not gonna mention his name. If you went in to see him, you would sit across the little desk, he would look at your eyes. If you dared to say a word, he would shush you. 20 minutes later, he would tell you 
what you needed to pick up at the front desk and what was wrong with you. And you would go and buy your stuff and be gone and come back three weeks later. No conversation, no wanting to get to know you, not just literally looking in your eyes and telling you what's wrong, right? Not my favorite way of working, that's for sure. Traditional Jensen iridologists practice that way. Modern Jensenians have the advantage that when Bernard passed away, his daughter-in-law took over the business. He basically left it to her. And she has glommed on to constitutional and she's integrated a lot of constitutional concepts into her work. In many ways, she still works in a Jensenian style of slicing and dicing into microscopic pieces, but she's at least more uh, recognizing the interaction of different organs and things like that and not relying on just a single marking to come up with an answer or a problem. Rayed is about emotions and about personality traits. Rayad teaches that emotional traits are genetic and are revealed by markings in the eye rides. If you have been around children and if you've known the extended family, you will often see that a young child has a mannerism that is just like a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt that they've never met before. And you go, how does that happen? It's imprinted in the genes, right? Rayad also teaches us that readings may be done cold. Information can be gathered from the eye rides and it may be combined with personal and family history information for interpretation. So to help you understand this person's emotional um, perspectives on things, right? And their genetically emotional perspectives. Founded by Denny Johnson, continued by Jim Burgess. Denny's still in the, in the game. Uh, he's doing some interesting research kind of stuff right now. In Europe, John Andrews is doing a different leg of emotional iridology. So again, we've got even with emotional iridology, we've got a couple of different schools, a couple of different perspectives, and they're not necessarily the same, which doesn't mean either is bad. It just means I wish they would figure out a way to meld them and create something that's unified. Constitutional originated with Joseph Deck and others. So many of those early researchers who were doing this without the benefit of computers and really good high resolution cameras. Medical doctors in Italy, Germany, and Russia use this. I just had a client in a few weeks ago from Turkey and she said, she's actually a medical doctor in Turkey, but she can't practice here because she hasn't done the board exams. And when I asked her, could I take photos of her eyes to do iridology? She said, oh yes, that's the first thing we do when we see a patient in Turkey is we look closely at their eyes to see what the eyes are going to give us for information. It's like, cool, she knew what I was doing. Correlative medical studies are being done. There's an ongoing study happening in California. It's been about seven or eight years in the process where they've been doing research on the MTHFR defect and eye pigment. Very interesting stuff. Constitutional teaches that the eyes are a reflection of the genetic structure of the body and add epigenetics to this. Right? We're, there's so much information about epigenetics now that uh, it's as we learn more and more about genes and turning them on and off, and we start to correlate that to the eyes, it's pretty mind blowing what we're seeing. And constitutional is the foundation of it. it's what I teach in the dynamic iridology assessment system program. Uh, Jennifer, you're new to iridology so, iridology, so excited to have you with us. Thank you for being here. Constitutional iridology teaches us that iridology does not give us the answers. It tells us what questions to ask. So that's gonna be different from a lot of what you've seen on the internet. There are people on social media who do free iris analysis, you send in really poorly done photos and they will tell you everything that's wrong with you and everything you need to do. And it usually boils down to you need to buy about a thousand dollars worth of their very special herbal products. That sounds really sarcastic and really cheeky. And yes, it is because that is not iridology, right? Because they recommend when you listen to them, they recommend the exact same things for absolutely everybody. Okay. Iridology, we take the client's symptoms, what they want help with. We look at the eyes, what information do the eyes give us? What information do the eyes give us to help us understand why our client has these symptoms? Then what questions do we need to ask further 
to understand how everything ties together so that we can create a protocol that's going to take our client to the next step in their health. We can use um, our other iris and sclera changes may continue to become visible with time, revealing areas that may need support. And background information is important. Readings are not done cold. I don't even use an intake form with my clients. They sign a release form, but they do not sign a questionnaire or they don't fill in a questionnaire. I use the, what would you like my help with? And their iris photos as my questionnaire. That's what guides the questions I need to ask because they might not need, probably won't need 90% of the questions that would be on a standard questionnaire, but they probably need 15 different questions that you would not put on a standard questionnaire. Does that make sense? Does that make sense that we use iridology to guide our questions? If that makes sense, give me, yes, ma'am, says Tessa. Thank you so much. So we want that background information. I have never had a client complain about not having to fill out a form. And my clients, when they leave, they often say to me, because the appointments are 60 to 75 minutes long. And they will say to me, I appreciate that you were listening. Um, you're the only person who listens to me. I've got lots of clients that have been with me for decades now. I could do their appointments in 15 minutes. I know them that well. They still book an hour because they want someone to listen to them. They want to be heard, right? That background information is so much a part of healing, so critical. So I started learning iridology in 1979. Constitutional had not yet made it to Canada. It was only in its infancy in the US. And of course, I because all we had was Jensen, I studied that, I embraced it. And I was absolutely sure this was just cast in stone, accurate, gospel true. Oh my goodness. Yes, this is such good stuff. But after about five years, I began to see, mm, this isn't working. It's not working the way I was taught it would work. And after 10 years, I kept struggling trying to can I make this work. Can I twist it? Can I turn it? Can I shape it? And I was never able to make the Jensenian style work. And I was ready to just walk away and just go, that was an interesting experiment in futility. But that was when I had the opportunity, just nothing is accidental, right? The opportunity to start learning constitutional iridology. As a Jensenian, every one of these would have been called a lesion. And every one of these would have been a critical problem happening right now this would have been like oh my goodness we'd better panic yesterday all of these would be a problem this little patch of yellowy stuff here would have been toxicity um this would have been um what do we have else this would have been inflammation and if we had done the right herbs and the right cleanse we would get rid of all of this gummy looking stuff in here and we would get rid of all of these. These lines were telling us that the person was healing. And we would say that on a first appointment, except that we didn't have photos from years ago that showed that this was empty. We just called these healing lines. Well, if we didn't have a before that was empty and an after with the lines, how could we say they had magically appeared and that this person was healing? I never saw healing lines appear in an eye. Tessa says, wow, that's very different than the way you teach now. It is. It is so different. So different. So after having put numerous clients with eyes like this through cleanses and fasts and special herbal programs and not seeing any results, that's when the frustration started to set in. Let's look at how this would be now as a constitutional assessment. I would always want to know what the, what the client's concerns were, right? And I don't have this client's name right in front of me, so I don't even remember their story now. I would need to see the name to remember the story. So what we know is this client did not do anything to put these in their eye. The eye rides are genetic, and the information in the eye rides has been passed down from the last three to four generations. So this tells us 
some of the genetic potentials, not the absolutes, but the potentials that have been passed down through the generations. We can cleanse this person. We can fast this person. We can put them on every magical herb under the sun. These are not going to go away. These do suggest that there is an inherent risk of some possibility of things not working right in the organs that correspond to these areas, right? We've got a map of the iris, much like a reflexology map for the feet, right? And so the other thing this tells us, rather than looking at each one of these and going, oh, problem, 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 ah, uh, Tessa, yes, you beat me to the punch. Good job, good job. When we see so many of these, it suggests an overarching predisposition towards hormonal imbalances. Ah, so now client symptoms, what are they? How do those symptoms suggest a hormonal imbalance? Is this a woman having menstrual issues or perimenopausal issues or problems getting pregnant? Is this someone who's maybe got blood sugar issues? Do they have thyroid issues? How's their adrenal gland? So we can now start to focus in on those things. And the interesting thing is so much of what we do for one endocrine gland has positive spillover effects to the other endocrine glands. So again, what are the symptoms? What do the eyes tell us? What more information do we need? Symptoms plus eyes give us questions. Then we can make recommendations, right? Other things, this suggests this is a person who is probably very creative. If they're feeling unwell, what are they doing to express their creativity? So many people have their creativity squashed at a very young age. You know, we don't do art in this family. Get a real job. Go to university and get a degree. Get a real job, right, kind of thing. And they're not allowed to have creative expression. And yet, when we let them have that creative expression, their healing begins. Okay. So we look at this from so many different angles. As a Jensenian, oh my goodness, this person is toxic. This person is so full of garbage, probably did sulfa drugs for too many, too many prescriptions. And yeah, they're just, they are so toxic. All of this, these eyes should be blue. And if we would just do the cleanse, we can turn these eyes blue. Okay, well, never saw that happen either. Now, you know, and I had teachers and I had that would say that and I believed them I trusted my teachers we looked at books that talked about how these things would change and then one of the books the author had her feet held to the fire so to speak and she admitted that to get her before and after photos she had used color filters because she was up against a print deadline and I knew they would change she said and I knew how they would change so I knew that if I use, I could just use color photos and mimic that change and we would be fine. Only she wasn't fine. Um, you know, we also need to consider with things like before and after photos is what was the technology that was used? There's a, a woman, I don't even know her name. She's on YouTube and she talks about how her eyes used to be brown and now they're blue by going on an all fruit diet. And when you look at the two photos, one is a very bad school photo. Is there such a thing as a good school photo? I ask you, they're always done in very warm tones, which means everything is going to look more brown, everything. The image that shows her having brown, blue eyes is done in bright natural light. Two very different cameras, two different sets of lighting, even so far as different paper that they were printed on, that will all change the output. We, we've known that for ages. I knew when I, when I shot, when I did iridology photos with film, I knew Kodak shot warm, and I think it was Fuji that shot more to the green tones. So you had to know your camera, then you had to know your paper, and then you had to adjust in your mind for all of those bits and pieces. Changing the camera or the lighting and the room lighting, it all changes the output. So 
um, as I was getting more and more frustrated and getting ready to walk away, I'd get a person like this who you need to cleanse and I put them on a cleanse and we wouldn't see the change. They would feel better. Isn't that the real reason we were doing this was to help them feel better, to help them regain their health. Did it matter if their eyes changed? People would say, well, how do I know if it's working? Well, do you feel better? If you feel better, it's working. Like you don't need an outside validation here. How are you feeling? Constitutional iridology, I would look at this instead and I would say, hmm, okay, we're gonna, we don't have the symptoms, so I'm gonna fly blind here. Lots of yellow. That suggests kidneys want to have a huge impact on everything. Lots of browns. That suggests liver wants to have an impact. The browns and the yellows, browns are focused in the nutritive zone, yellows are focused in the nutrient transport zone, and they are spanning the cholerate, which is one of the most important indicators of the nervous system. So we know kidneys and liver want to in, impact, yes, digestion and yes, nutrient transport, but also nervous system. Okay. So what are the client's symptoms? Does the client have kidney symptoms, food retention, blood pressure issue, puffy bags under their eyes, sore joints, but that's just a few of them. Do they have lab tests that show that they've got poor filtration? Right? How's their creatinine? Things like that, right? What indicators do we have that the kidney's out of balance? Digestion, gassy, burpy or farty. Uh, how, what's their bowel transit time? Are there foods they've learned to avoid because they don't sit well uh, or they cause an actual reaction, right? Um, when we see these rings coming around here, we said with Jensen, this person was either headed into a nervous breakdown or coming out of one. How would you like to be told you are so close to a nervous breakdown? No, this tells us the person burns through their, their nerve nutrients, tells us they internalize their stress and they like to be busy. So what do they do for relax time? How do they calm the noise? How do they let their body rest? How do they let go of stress? What is the client's diet? What is their lifestyle? What is the client doing for their health? Right, and that's all going to tie back into what we've seen in the eyes. And those questions come from the eyes. We haven't asked anything way out there. We've looked at the eyes, looked at the symptoms and come up with the questions. The beauty of doing iridology this way one of the beautiful things, oh, there's so many beautiful things. One of the beautiful things is that we do the assessment based on today's symptoms. We create the program right here, right now. So they leave the office with a plan. What are a couple of dietary things we want to do? Is there a lifestyle something? Are there a couple of supplements we want to implement here? They leave with a rock solid plan. They leave knowing that what we've done today is not everything they need to know for the rest of their life. It's to take them up one notch because we're going to build a healthier lifestyle one appointment at a time. We're going to, each time we meet, ask how have the symptoms responded? How's your body responding? Oh, those symptoms are gone. Oh, it's so great. What else are you noticing? Well, now I'm feeling this. Ah, we had to get rid of that first symptom for you to see the second one. Now let's understand where that symptom is coming from, which organs are involved, which organs are still out of balance. How do we need to continue to shape the diet, the lifestyle? What supplements do we need to move around to take you to the next level? So we're doing this in baby steps that the client can manage very successfully. Does that sound like a good plan? Let me know if that sounds like a way that you think would, would work with the people you work with. And if you've been a silent minority today, I'd love to see your comment in, in the chat box. So again, with an eye like this, every one of these lesions, oh, I dislike that word terribly. Thank you, Jennifer. Every one of these lesions would be a problem that's happening right now. Instead, it gives us an understanding. This person is what we call a connective tissue constitution. 
lymphatic connective tissue. What does that mean? It means that she's prone to creating too much acid in her body and that her connective tissues genetically aren't robust. She'll be more prone to sprains and strains, joint issues, right? She's gonna be a, more prone to the structure of her body not being robust. And especially if she carries an elevated acid level, that's going to put a strain, an additional strain on her structure. So how did I get to that? Oh, I'm just that brilliant Tessa. <laughs> um, well, because she's lymphatic and because she's got these pigments in here. These are the dots that I teach you how to connect in the course, right? I teach you how to get there really quickly so you don't have to labor over every little point. So with this client, what we've done is we've um, taken away her coffee, screaming and kicking, no, not my coffee, not my coffee. Yes, your coffee, we're taking that away. We're going to get you to chew your foods a whole lot better. We want you to drink clean water, right? And we're going to have you get protein three times a day. And here's some help digesting it. Let's start there, right? Because we're not going to change her eye structure, but maybe by giving her the right nutrients, we can help her body function better within its genetic capacity, right? Because every genetic thing we have most genetic things are a range of possibility. If you treat your body poorly, you're gonna come out at the bottom end. If you treat your body well, you'll come out at the top end of your possibility. And so that's where we want to be working is always guiding our client to the top end of their possibility. You know, I when I first learned constitutional, uh, Harry Wolf and Bill Cardona had produced some v VHS. Oh my goodness, do you even know what VHS videotapes are? <laughs> have I just dated myself terribly VHS videotapes and I still have them I don't have a tape player but I it was like six hours of training and that was my first training in constitutional and as I watched those videotapes so many times and made notes on them so many times and would add notes between my notes and would just pad them up and oh my goodness and then I actually bought, brought Bill to Canada twice to teach certification classes here and just oh I'm still in touch with him and I'm so appreciative of him. Back to our eye, this is not toxicity. This is the body genetically teaching us that one body, one organ wants to be out of balance and it wants to create stress for another organ. So when we then see symptoms either in the organ of origin or in the organ of destination, we know we need to do two things. We need to have a chat with that organ of origin and we need to teach it a few remedial lessons and get it back on track as best we can. Maybe that means this person's going to need to take some supplements for the rest of their life to keep that going well. And then we need to have a chat with that organ of destination and we need to kind of give it some love and soothe it like a child that's been picked on because it has, it's been picked on. We need to soothe it, we need to nourish it, we need to nurture it so that it realizes it's loved and we can help it function a little bit better as well to the best of its possibility, right? Constitutional iridology teaches us to look for patterns and to understand the interrelationship of organs where a Jensenian would look at this and would start picking out each individual little shape and each individual shaded area and each individual pigment. As constitutionalists, we take that step back and we go, how does this work together to get our client to where they're at now? And how do we use this to get our client out of where they are now, right? More holistic, that is the perfect way to see this, Tessa, more holistic. So this person might have issues with connective tissue, with kidneys not keeping up, with liver, lymph lymphatic system, immune system. Again, we need to know what the symptoms are. We need to know what the diet is. We need to know what the lifestyle is. We can't just say what the problems are without knowing how they're feeling and what's going on. And then we want to teach them. We want to guide them. We are teachers. We are not healers. We are teachers. Our job is to teach and to empower our clients so that they can instigate the healing themselves. That's what we are after here. And whether we're making dietary recommendations or supplements or lifestyles, whatever your background is, or some of all of that, that's perfect. And that's what I strive to teach my students in the course is I strive to teach them 
let me rephrase that. I strive to get them to, to draw on what they already know. So if their background is holistic nutrition, and we see an eye like this, and we begin to understand the chemistry that this person has, then I'm going to ask that student, and what would be three specific food changes you would want to see this person do? What are three things you would want them to include? What might be three things you would want them to take out of their diet? Right. And I get my students integrating their existing knowledge with iridology because iridology doesn't stand alone. It integrates. Old iridology would say this person is stressed, headed for a nervous breakdown, has parasites and needs a parasite cleanse right now, if not four years ago. You've probably heard things like that on social media, right? Constitutional says, look at this eye in the context of the owner. It, uh, and Tess is saying it was close with the stress kind of. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So this is the eye of an Asian woman. She was in her mid thirties and she and her husband had been trying to conceive for three years. They had been to the fertility clinic and the fertility clinic gave them metformin and, and Clomid and that was it. And they just said, this is how you use these drugs, go home and get pregnant. They did one, one cycle with the Clomid and absolutely no results. And that's when they finally decided to come see me. Her cycles were running 90 days, which is absolutely guaranteed an infertile cycle. If she was to conceive on a 90 day cycle, the likelihood of it being ectopic or miscarrying is like almost a guarantee, almost a guarantee. And so um, as I'm looking at her eyes, and I know that they want to get pregnant and I know her cycles are 90 days apart. I ask her some questions like, have the doctors ever suggested that this would be that you have polycystic ovarian syndrome? Oh yeah, that's what they called it. Well, what's the thing that is always like this with PCOS, like 95% of the time, anybody know? What is the other um, comorbid condition that exists with PCOS? Anybody know? It's a fair, a fair thing to put no idea. Tessa, Tessa has been with me while she says blood sugar. Shoot. I know I've heard you say it. <laughs> I love that. Tessa. So good. So good. Yeah. Type two diabetes, insulin resistance. They are best buddies with PCOS, right? So I asked her, has anyone ever suggested that you might be insulin resistant? And that's when she told me she was on metformin or that she had metformin. She wasn't on it, but she had it. And apparently her blood sugars were leaving. She was a petite little thing. You know, we often think of insulin resistance as people who are overweight and PCOS as well, but she was not. She was very petite. Looking at her eyes, I know that she burns through her B vitamins very quickly. B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, magnesium. So B vitamins, she probably needs folic acid. She's got one tiny little dark brown pigment here, which tells me she needs methylated Bs. If I give her a non-methylated folic acid, a non-methylated B12, it's actually going to exacerbate her problems. It's not going to make things better. So I know I have to give her um, a methylated uh, prenatal vitamin that has methylated Bs. I also know from this white ring here that she is not handling her carbohydrates well. And that's going back to liver enzymes. Well, isn't that interesting? The liver is supposed to methylate Bs. If she has PCOS, she likely doesn't methylate her Bs. That's a liver problem. And we've got all of these things coming back to the liver. And so we got her on, we actually put her on a candida diet because it's the fastest, most direct way to get the carb intake down. Like her breakfast were a sweet roll with juice and her lunch was white rice with sweet sauces on it. And her supper was white rice with sweet sauce. And there might be some meat in that, but not likely. So it was pure carbs. And so we got her doing an anti-candida diet, took away all the refined carbs, got her doing protein three times a day, got her doing lots of veggies, lots of leafy greens, got her to start working out for 30 minutes a day. On a work day, she would just walk the stairs in her office tower. And on the weekend, she and her husband would go for walks. I didn't need it to be a spandex workout. I just needed her to be moving her body, right? She did such a good job. 
over the course of six months, the first six months we worked together, we got her cycles from 90 days down to high 30s, which is brilliant. Now we've got a cycle that is a fertile cycle, right? Where she could conceive and carry. This was brilliant. It took another full year of us working together, constantly doing little tweaks to her program. This herb, take away that herb, shift this supplement, use this herb for just the first, just the luteal phase or just the follicular phase. We really worked hard with her. We had an appointment every month, every month. And um, 12 months after getting her cycles down to, to those the high 30s, mid to high 30s, they conceived. She had a beautiful baby boy and the doctors were amazed in a four hour labor and she did not ever develop gestational diabetes. The doctors said, you will definitely have gestational diabetes. You know, your blood sugars were so out of control. She did such a good job. She and her husband, they were a team. And so much of what I suggested for them came from the eyes, came from the eyes. I understood. I mean, she's got radial froze going through the ovary and through uterus. So I knew the ovaries um, had some involvement here, had some, some weak links and we needed to support that. And we just kept working and building and yeah, it was so, so fun. I remember I was sitting in church with my, with my pregnant clients where, where I'm seeing them every month. Um, I give them my personal phone number and I was sitting in church one morning and my phone rang. Oops. But I, I thought she would be in labor pretty soon. So I nipped out of the church meeting and she was in labor. It was, when do we go to the hospital? What do we do with this? And I said, no, you're perfect. You're doing beautifully. You know, yeah, if you can talk to me this calm and this relaxed for this long, you're not quite ready for the hospital yet, but you're doing so well. You know, it wasn't long before she was ready. Very exciting. I don't mind interrupting my church meetings to be supportive to my laboring moms. So here's one of the myths. Okay, we're going to start dispelling some myths here. Um, can we monitor your progress and see changes in your eye rights? These are my husband's eyes taken at the age of 42 and at the age of 65. Notice the camera. This little light tells you, that alone tells you it was a different camera, different lighting. This was incandescent light. And this was, with that, this was a print, this was print. And I happened to get a scan of it. Okay, I don't have the print anymore. This was my original iridology camera. This was my first digital camera, my first 24 megapixel that had an LED light. Different brands. This was a, an Olympus camera. This was a Canon. That's going to account for some difference. The, the fact that this was print, this was digital, that's going to account for some difference. Right? So Pete, there's a lot of people who would say, well, the eye on the right is so much bluer. Boy, has he ever done a lot of cleansing work? Uh uh. No, I just try to feed him healthy all the time and keep him on supplements and make him work out with me and yeah, try to keep him healthy, right? But this wasn't the result of cleansing. Oh, but these fibers are wobbly. They're wavy. These are so much straighter. That's so much better. Uh uh. Pupil is larger. That's going to compress the iris tissue. That's going to make the fibers look wavy. Pupil is smaller. It's a brighter light that pulls the fibers straighter. Right. So Tessa says, is there a general category that a radial fro suggests, like a contraction fro suggests, possibly need nerve nutrients? Not a general category. Um, your radial furrows always suggest an interruption in nerve feed. And then depending on various characteristics about the radial furrow will teach you more about what you should do because of it. So we don't see changes. We don't monitor the progress in the eye rides. We might see changes in the sclera. The sclera is much more dynamic. But uh, again, it's going to depend on how long the marking has been there. I call this as Harry Potter, Harry Potter scar. So when you look at this, this one was much lighter. Two decades later, it's much heavier. But two, two decades ago, this was much heavier. And now look at how much lighter it is. 
right? So the, the blood vessels in the sclera can change and they give us a more dynamic read on things. Okay. And notice that we've got pigment here at the age of 65 that he didn't have at the age of 42. Pigment has accumulated. But pigment does not disperse, it only accumulates. What about those healing lines we talked about? Okay, let's talk about healing lines. This is my eye. Um, and for those of you who know anything about iridology, you now know all of my secrets. In 2017, I happened to take this photo because I got a new camera and see that's all just fun. Notice the color difference again, a part of that, uh, the most of that is a different camera, different settings on the camera. Okay, that's, that's going to account for all of the color variations here. March of 2019, I fell and broke my arm in two places and ended up in surgery. If you look at a Jensen map, this is the area that the arm shows up in. And look, this is two years before. This is literally five days after a double break, basically a double surgery with two plates put in my arm. And it doesn't look any different than it does over here. Right? That's pretty crazy wild. Pretty crazy wild. Looks just the same. So then just to prove the point, 10 weeks after I broke my arm in two places, I fell down some stairs and I broke the same arm. I broke my elbow, right? I ended up in surgery to repair that and to put in some wire. And so you see that down here, same arm, it looks exactly the same. Fibers are a little tiny bit wobblier because the pupil is a little bit bigger. And this was, this was actually about 10 days after surgery. I do not do well with a general anesthetic. I'm sure my brain took weeks to recover. And then I figured, you know, why not just check it out again later? And it's really exactly the same. You know, if we were using the owls thing, we the owl story, we would have expected to see a black line coming down in here at the break. And then we would have expected to see that fill in, but it didn't, it didn't, and you know, my scars have healed really well. You probably can't see them if I show them to you, but it's all on this arm, right? So healing lines, they don't happen. Neither will there be an indication that you've had surgery. There's not gonna be a black line in the eye for surgery or for a broken bone. It just doesn't happen. Back to my husband's eyes, pigments, can we cleanse them? Can we? What can we do to get rid of them? Oh, I'm telling you, I put my husband through so many things. He loves me. And that's a good thing because I'll put him on herbal cleanses. I'll get worried about him. I don't want him to, to get old, right? So I'll put him on a cleanse, put him, we'll go on a special nutritional diet together to rebalance things. We're always doing something. And he still accumulates pigment in his eyes. That's not toxins. It's epigenes giving us information. Harry Wolf said this, in fact, it's bogus and a dogma only found in some holdouts from the Lindlar, Kreitzer and Jensen schools of thought. The notion that certain metals, minerals, toxins routinely show up as diagnostic indicators in the iris has long been refuted and proven unreliable. There is no evidence to support the notion that heavy metal toxicity is measurable in the iris. Likewise, drugs candida. The dark spots are, gen are genetically predetermined as is the overall color scheme. Can you make lacunae disappear with cleansing? Now, why do I have, oh, there we go. Okay, I know what I'm talking about here. I was wondering where, where why, why do I have these slides up? So I want you to look right here. We've got some tiny little lacunae in the nutritive zone. And look at them, they're bigger here. Again, um, different camera. This is my newest iteration of, of my lighting system. That's why we've got the different colors here. This lighting system is gentler. It's not quite as bright. So we have a larger pupil. And the larger pupil is going to compress the iris tissue. It's going to take narrow markings like this and make them look fatter. So when people say, oh, look, that lacuna is getting smaller, that lesion is getting smaller, take a look at the pupil. Is the pupil the same size? No, it won't be. And it's that difference in the size of the pupil 
that shifts, whether it compresses the tissues of the iris to make things look wider, or if it's a bright light, it'll stretch the tissues to make those things look narrower. Does that make sense? Can you see that? If you can see that, give me an IC in the chat box. Ah, Tessa, thank you. Anybody else see that? Is Tessa the only one who's seeing things today? Jennifer sees it. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. And Erica sees it too. Fantastic. So good. So good. Can we see parasites? Okay, what have we said about the irides? That they're that they are genetic and they are epigenetic. They are uh, genetic. I think you meant genetic, not generic. Oops. Yeah, <laughs> I love that, Tessa. I love that. Okay, so are parasites genetic? If I have some kind of parasite and I have a child, would I pass that on to my child through my genes or would I pass it to them through exposure? Tessa says, no, you wouldn't pass it on. No, it would be through exposure, wouldn't it? Through exposure. So you don't see parasites. These black radiating lines are about ex if you have parasites, they're not gonna show up here. If you've got parasites, they're from exposure to, to that, whatever, you know, that, that, uh, that parasite egg, if you will. This radial furrows are about the nervous system, not about parasites. We could parasite cleanse this person. This is that, that uh, Asian mom that I worked with. We could parasite cleanse her until the cows come home. And that would be a challenge because I have no cows to come home. And those lines would not disappear. Okay. So which iridology chart is correct? Well, it depends on what kind of iridology you want to do. You're going to see a lot of iridology maps out there. And many of them are subdivided into such tiny little sections that if you are off by even just like one degree on the horizon, like you're flying an airplane, you're off by one degree on the horizon, your whole assessment's gonna be wrong. And you're assigning all kinds of problems to all kinds of things that don't exist. When we're doing constitutional iridology, I, uh, we are looking at organs and systems that are metabolically reactive, right? my pinky finger is likely not affecting how my pancreas works, but my liver sure does, right? My brain is going to affect things. Um, my eyes are not going to affect things. Right? So I'm not going to use, I don't want those extra things on my map as a general map to use. Tessa says, I like yours best so far. The course I took used a different map and it was way too much, if that makes sense. I, it does make sense. I've got lots of different iridology maps and they all have way too much on them. The problem with that is you get bogged down. Even if you're on the perfect level with your photos, you're going to get bogged down in details that are irrelevant to your client and their situation. It's not going to do anybody any good. So we like to use the constitutional map. This is based on the work of Bill Cardona. He developed the first constitutional map that I saw and he had been out of teaching for about 20 years. And I approached him and I, as I was starting to teach, I said, can I take your map and build on it because we've got new information? He went, absolutely, take it and go with it. He said, I would give you the original digital files, but my office manager had them. And when she passed away, she lived in Florida, he lived in Seattle. And so she was a, a virtual assistant distantly. And she said, he said, when she passed away, her office got cleaned out and all the files were lost. So I had to start from scratch, but I had his blessing to go ahead with this. Now, for those of you who would like a copy of this, I'm gonna put, put this put a link in the chat box. There you go. Grab that link and you'll, it'll take you to a place where you can enter your details to receive the download of this map by email, okay? So we're not going to get hung up on anything that doesn't affect metabolism. So here's another question. Is brown pigment in a blue eye an indication of toxicity? Is yellow pigment an indication of sulfur buildup? No and no. Absolutely not. 
Tessa's got it negative, negative big bird. Absolutely. Another question is white in a blue iris an indication of scarring or stagnant lymph? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There are a lot of people out there where the only solution to every health problem is to work on the lymphatic system. I agree the lymphatic system is very important, but if you've got someone who's already got a clean diet and they're physically active and their lymphatic system is flushing very nicely, they can still, and they will still have any of the, the lymphatic system markers in their eyes that they've always had, right? So it's not an indication of these things being current situations. Um, another myth, you can learn everything you need to know about iridology from books and YouTube videos, and even from mini classes like this. Mm, if by everything you mean that one mark means one problem, then, then yeah, you can. However, that's a really shallow level. It's kind of uh, bringing iridology down to the level of a party game. If on the other hand, what you want to learn is iridology at a professional level, one where you can quickly and accurately assess from symptoms and what you see in the eyes, you know, to know what questions to ask. One that teaches you how the different markers work together to think through an eye. I don't teach cookie cutter formulas. I teach you how to take what you know about anatomy and physiology and what you know about nutrition or herbology or whatever else you do. And I teach you how to take that and apply it to the eye to get a deeper understanding of how things connect. That's why you have to have anatomy and physiology under your belt before you come to me. Tessa says, you can learn enough to make you wanna learn more though. Yes, you can, you can. Just don't fool yourself to thinking you know enough to do it as a professional iridologist. So what you really need then is you need a course, you need a mentor, right? So can we diagnose diseases using iridology? No, we absolutely cannot name diseases. Diagnosis is a medical procedure. And in every jurisdiction that I've ever seen or heard of, it is the, the property of medical doctors. And in some places in the world, naturopaths. Um, but we do not, we do not diagnose now. When I started out as a Jensenian, we were diagnosing left, right, and center. Oh my goodness. As I think back, I'm very lucky I didn't end up in jail. And the interesting thing is that I was usually wrong usually wrong. So now we don't do that, right? We know that we use iridology as an assessment tool to help us understand the client's physiology and to help us build rapport. Right? We're looking at the eyes. We are asking questions that are specific about the client, not generic questions. We build rapport. We know that iridology is a powerful assessment tool, a very powerful assessment tool. So you might want to know things like how long does it take to learn iridology? The way I teach it to learn iridology is 20 weeks, 20 lessons, right? And then there's mentorship after that as well to make sure that you're doing, doing iridology really well and confidently. Can you earn a living with iridology? Not by itself. You need to have something to put with it, right? nobody wants to go to a car mechanic to be told, well, we know what the problem is, but we don't fix cars here. We only, we only tell you what's wrong. You have to take it down the road to get it fixed. If all you know is how to assess an eye, but you don't know how to create a protocol, you don't have nutrition or herbology, you're never going to get anywhere with it. So you need to have nutrition or herbology to turn this iridology into an assessment tool that you can earn a living with. I found a course that is taught from books and videos. Good enough? Again, it depends on how deep you want to go. Now, I say that because I still have questions about iridology. I call them my 2 a.m. questions. Those are the ones that I send to Bill Cardona. I know he must roll his eyes. Actually, he doesn't. He's a sweet sweetheart. Um, but I come up with these really weird questions, and I need to ask them of somebody who knows more than I do, and I know Bill will answer them for me, right? And so really the best way to learn is with someone who will answer your questions, who will mentor you, who will help to help you to understand the process of working through it 
so that you can find the answers really effectively. So, so important. So I think live instruction is best, even if it's over a webinar and it's interactive. Um, could frequency healing help too? Yeah, absolutely, Jennifer. It absolutely could. So if you understand based on symptoms and imbalances that you discover by doing iridology and by understanding your client's symptoms, if that helps you to understand what frequencies you need to use, you could absolutely use frequencies. I have many students who do aromatherapy or flower essences, right? I've got a physical therapist in Alaska and she has integrated this in with her physical therapy. So you just have to have something that is, um, will integrate with it, right? And again, when I'm teaching a course, I try to draw that out and help my students see how their existing skills will integrate so that they can, when, as they're going through the course, they can actually start using what they're learning. Dynamic Iridology Assessment System is the only live online fully mentored course for nutritionists, herbalists, naturopaths. Think of that as anyone who has a college level anatomy and physiology course under their belt already. So that if they're already seeing clients, they can streamline their work without sacrificing client care. I just spoke with a potential student earlier today and she, said that it takes her often six to eight hours to write a report that she sends to her clients and then she's finding out they're not reading the reports. It's like, what a waste of time. How about we teach you iridology so that you can create the protocol while you're with your client, send them out with the notes that they took about what you've taught them. Next client, please. Right? So we wanna stop doing unpaid overtime to create reports. We want to stop overwhelming, overwhelming our clients. If it takes you six to eight hours to write a report, you're, you're snowballing your client. They're drowning in the information. They don't know where to start with this. We want your client to be compliant. A simple, succinct program that is targeted to them is how we do that. And that's going to lead to long-term retention. I'm seeing a client again on Friday. She has been with me now for 40 years, like from the beginning. Uh, she's probably in 43 years now. We were chatting the last time she was in to figure out because we were both having babies which baby was she having and which baby was I having and that we figured out okay so that's been about you know I think it was 41 years so it must be 42 or 43 now next course start date is November 28th if you are in, interested in getting more information about the course I'm going to post that link here I'm giving you lots of links head on over to that course, see if you like what you see. And if you do, there's an invitation there for you to schedule a time to chat with me about the course for us to see if it's a good fit. Now, only book a time to chat with me if you have a college level anatomy and physiology course under your belt. If you don't already have that, shoot me an email and I will send you a link to the course that I would want you to complete before we talk about learning iridology. Fair enough. Let's get the prerequisites done. So Jennifer says, I need to start out with anatomy and physiology. Excellent. You know what? So, um, so Jennifer, may I, with your permission, make a note to email you that link for the anatomy course? Alrighty, so I'm just making that note that you want the A and P course link. It's a self-paced course. You do it on your own, depending on how much time you've got and how focused you are. You could be ready for the November 28th start date. All right, so let's see what we can do with that. And uh, Mike Knapp, a naturopath in Arizona, I asked him, why did you take my course? What, what appealed to you? He said the interactive online platform with an experienced teacher and practitioner. You said the fundamentals of iridology could be learned in this format. And that's what was delivered plus a lot more on how to integrate it directly into current practice. I'm very happy with this training. So thank you. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So again, there we have it. Um, again, if you need the A&P link, let me know. I'm happy to send that to you. And as soon as you've got that like 75% done, you're really close to having it done, we can have a conversation to talk about the next step. The a and P isn't just my requirement. In order for you to be certified with the International Iridology Practitioners Association, 
they will require proof that you have completed the A and P with a grade of over 80%, right? And so they've approved the course that I recommend. And that's why I send my students there. And by getting the A and P done before you do iridology, we can go so much deeper with the iridology. We can go so much deeper that it will really make the time you spend learning iridology very worthwhile. You will come out of the class knowing iridology and knowing how to apply it in a clinical setting rather than just knowing the markings. All righty. All right. So would you teach us how to fix things also, like with herbs, for example, or do we need to secure that? So that's a really good question, Tessa. We do touch on herbs and nutrition. I do offer some basic recommendations throughout the course, things you could consider. So again, no cookie cutters, no cookie cutters ever in my courses. Um, but you will learn some basic herbs on a very surface level and some basic nutrition. And that's enough usually to get my people started. And then you can go ahead and you know take a herb course or take a nutrition course. The school that I recommend for the a and also offers is a nutrition school. And so that would be another place to go to get nutrition training, perhaps holistic nutrition, not dietitian or, and it's not like a four month course. It's like a full year course. It's a really, it's a very decent course. Um, and so we teach a little bit of that, but you also are going to draw on what you already know, right? Because everyone on this call has some skills under their belt already. And again, my goal is to help you draw on what you know to integrate it with iridology, right? And then once you've done this course, you know, if you wanna do some advanced courses in herbology or, you know, on women's health or things like that, I offer those to people who are certified iridologists and or graduates of my dynamic iridology program. So we can take you deeper as well in those ways. But for now, let's get the a &P done. Let's get the iridology done. Good questions tonight, good comments. Thank you so much for that. Any other questions or comments tonight? So good to have you with me tonight, so good. Ah, Tessa says, I thought I had to do it the other way around. Sounds amazing. I've always wanted to learn herbology. Fantastic, fantastic. All righty. Well, with that, my friends, again, thank you for spending this hour and a quarter. We went way over time. Thank you for your patience and for hanging on with me tonight. I truly appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. I hope you benefited from our time together as well. And I look forward to possibly hearing from some of you and um, for certain seeing you in the course at some time in the future. Tessa says it was a blast as always. Thank you, Tessa. Appreciate that. Have a great evening wherever you are, and we'll talk to you later. Bye for now. And Jennifer, just closing comment. It's fascinating and exciting. Thank you for your expertise and openness. You are most welcome, Jennifer. Always happy to share from the heart. Have a good one. Bye for now.